Hi guys, welcome to the channel. If you got my previous video where I did an unboxing and took my first look at the new Intel Skull Canyon NUC, um, and if you didn't, you should click here first and go and check it out, um, you'll know that this is my promised follow-up video where I benchmark this little guy to see if Intel's claims of much improved integrated graphics actually hold water. There's a lot to get through in this one, uh, but bear with me as there are some amazing numbers hidden throughout this video, so let's just jump right in. I'll start off with the noise, as a few people in the comments on the first video asked me how noisy the fan is. That was actually one of my key concerns as well when I first saw the press release for this thing. In normal use, it's completely silent, but when you push it hard, for example when you're gaming or running benchmarks, the fan obviously spins up. But it's a lot quieter under load than my MacBook Pro, however. Um, it's hard for me to capture the sound. Uh, I have to really turn the gain up on my Yeti mic, which is a very sensitive mic by the way. Um, and that causes it to pick up a lot of background noise. Um, this is a New York apartment after all. Uh, but I've positioned the mic where my left ear would be if I was sitting at the desk. Um, and I'll drop a USB stick on there to give you an idea of the relative volume. First the NUC. I'll power it on as that causes the fans to spin up until the drivers catch up. So normally it would rump up slowly, but you can now hear it on maximum volume. Now I'll run the Heaven benchmark on the MacBook Pro that's also on the desk, so you can hear the fans ramp up on that. I don't know if you can tell, but the NUC is definitely a lot quieter than the MacBook Pro. So now let's get to the juicy stuff, the benchmarks. I'm going to compare it to my mid-2015 15-inch MacBook Pro Retina. This is the base model with a quad-core Intel Core i7 4702HQ processor from the previous generation of processors to what's in the Skull Canyon. And it also has Iris Pro graphics, the 5200M version, versus the 580 that's in the NUC. This is a better comparison to make than Linnaean Hydra, as the 980 Ti in there is obviously going to blow this thing out of the water in games, so there's no value in me showing you that. First up, Geekbench, which is all about the CPU, and a 10% improvement over the 4702HQ in the MacBook Pro is underwhelming, especially given that we have a higher clock speed and, in theory, more instructions per clock. Now, Passmark. This includes CPU, 2D, 3D graphics, as well as memory and disk tests. Now, this is an interesting one, as it shows a 31% improvement. As the disk is not much faster than the PCIe SSD in the MacBook Pro, this suggests that there are some big improvements present in the graphics. Handbrake. Again, this is pure CPU, and we're only seeing a 7.6% improvement over the MacBook Pro. Underwhelming in a way, but of course, this thing does cost a lot less than a MacBook Pro. CompuBench is a series of OpenCL benchmarks. That's using the graphics card for certain compute tasks as opposed to drawing graphics. So let's start out with face detection in a crowd, and wow, look at that result. A whopping 266% improvement, and basically matching the results on the CompuBench site for the discrete NVIDIA GTX 960M GPU. On the particle simulation, we see a good 40% improvement over the MacBook Pro, but the 960M manages to score a good 25% higher, which is the same score the desktop GTX 950 gets, by the way. But look at that Bitcoin mining score. Okay, no one mines on GPUs anymore, but that's not the point. We're hashing over 280% faster than the MacBook Pro, and we're only scoring around 5% less than a desktop 660 Ti or GTX 860M laptop graphics card. If someone told you integrated graphics on a mobile processor could get to within 5% of a GTX 860M in anything, would you honestly have believed them? This test blows my mind. So moving on to PC Mark, the relatively lightweight home test has the NUC scoring nearly 9% higher than the MacBook Pro, and I included the result for my big desktop PC here, just to show that while it does score 25% higher than the NUC, the average Joe might have expected more, but this just proves that it's possible to waste money on an overpowered machine if your needs are pretty modest. Moving on to the work test, the results are even closer, with the NUC scoring less than 5% higher than the MacBook Pro, and even Linnea and Hydra here can't eke out much more than 13% improvement over the NUC. The creative workload pushes the systems a little harder as there's more graphics work involved. 
Here, the Skull Canyon manages to score nearly 19% higher than the MacBook Pro, and Linnaean Hydra starts to show its worth via this more demanding workload, pulling out 36% over the NUC. So you'd imagine that real professional creative work with huge Photoshop files and complex illustrations would cause the big beefy desktop to blow the doors off our humble NUC, right? Well, let's take a look at the Adobe Creative Cloud test results and see. Uh, what in the name of Gordon Moore happened here? Not only is Linnaean Hydra struggling to beat the MacBook Pro, but the NUC actually beat it. I double checked that the Adobe Suite was actually using GPU acceleration and I ran the test again with the same result. The NUC won every time. How is this possible? Uh, leave me a comment if you know what's going on here because I'm at somewhat of a loss to explain this one. So we've seen the raw CPU performance numbers, which were a bit meh, and the amazing OpenCL accelerated tasks in CompuBench. So now let's look at WebGL, which is responsible for the 2D and 3D graphics that you get in your web browser. Unity shows a huge 57% higher score for the Skull Canyon over the MacBook Pro. So finally, for the serious stuff, let's look at Cinebench, which shows a relatively unremarkable 16% improvement, again, over the MacBook Pro, although it's better than the synthetic CPU benchmark suggested. But the real improvement comes with the OpenGL result, which again shows a 45% increase in FPS over the Iris Pro that's in the Mac. So let's see if the OpenCL, WebGL, and OpenGL improvements carry through to the DirectX benchmarks. I use 1920 by 1080 resolution for all these tests, unless they're locked to 1280 by 720, as I think we all know that that's the best we can hope for. And anti-aliasing is another luxury that we can't afford, so I also turn that off. Incidentally, if you just fast forwarded to here, um, thanks for waiting for us to catch up, but you've missed some amazing numbers already. Unigine does show an average FPS improvement in excess of 30%. And while I did have to turn down the texture quality to low to get it to bench above 30 FPS, tessellation is actually set to extreme. I didn't bother with Firestrike, the results would obviously be pretty low. But in Skydiver, we see a nearly 37% improvement over the MacBook Pro. And as you can see on Fraps in the background there, we're hovering right around the 30 FPS mark most of the time. That's pretty impressive for integrated graphics. Uh, I also mined the FutureMark database for some Core i7 gaming laptops to compare with, and we're comfortably beating a 940M based machine by 7%. But that 860M that we saw earlier gets its revenge now with a whopping 63% lead. Uh, by request, I ran Dota 2 and benchmarked using a recent Fnatic game replay. With most of the good stuff turned on, we average 69 FPS with a variance of 9 FPS, far higher than most people need for Dota 2, and nearly 40% higher than the MacBook Pro. I then run the Final Fantasy XIV benchmark tool using the standard desktop preset instead of the standard laptop or high laptop, and the benchmark decided that our performance was rated high, with a figure over 30% higher than the Mac would muster, which caused it to drop its ranking to fairly high. I then decided to move up to something more challenging, a AAA title from three years ago and one of my personal favourites, Tomb Raider. On the high preset, the NUC averaged 41 FPS and it didn't dip below 31. That's over 64% higher than the MacBook Pro, which languished in the unplayable world of the low to mid 20s. So feeling confident, I went newer again to the end of 2015, uh, barely more than six months ago, to Metal Gear Solid 5. But this proved much tougher. I had to turn everything down to minimum to average 34 FPS at 1080p, and that would still dip to 27 even in light fight scenes. I then decided to go right up to date with Rise of the Tomb Raider, uh, another personal favourite, but even at a measly 1280 by 720 and with everything turned off or down, we were languishing in the low 20s on the inbuilt benchmark tool, so in other words it's basically unplayable. The final game, and again by special request in the comments on my last video, was Killer Instinct, which is an Xbox port. Uh, I ran this at 1280x720 with anti-aliasing, the only option, turned off. Uh, to get a pass by the benchmarking tool, you need to score 1000 or more, and the Skull Canyon just made it with 1017. The MacBook Pro wasn't as lucky, staggering home with a lowly 536. Um, less than the Skull Canyon managed on 1920x1080, in case you're wondering. But that's another impressive result with the latest Iris Pro integrated GPU scoring 90% higher than the Iris Pro in last year's MacBook Pro. Okay, so that was a lot to digest, um, but I'll try and summarize it here as I see it. In terms of pure CPU performance, we're not seeing much difference between the 4702 HQ in the MacBook Pro and the new 6770 HQ in the Skull Canyon. It's typically 6 to 12%. It's clear that Intel have spent more of their time working on improving the Iris Pro integrated graphics, which in my opinion was the right call. And let's face it, their efforts have really paid off. 
In terms of OpenCL performance, we're seeing anything from 40% to 280% improvement, and mostly the latter. Even matching a lot of discrete mobile GPUs and admittedly older desktop ones like the 660 Ti in some scenarios, that's monumental. And while that level of improvement doesn't carry through to DirectX games, we are seeing 30 to 40% in most cases, with 90% on some titles. In terms of a jump in performance over a previous generation, that's better than the improvements everyone's so excited about with regards to the GTX 1080 over the 980 Ti. So who is this NUC for, and is it worth $650? Ignoring games for a minute, obviously for home use it's basically as powerful as any desktop machine, and the same goes for office work. Even content creators and professional photographers should be more than satisfied, and if your work involves simulations and other sort of science work, uh, and you're used to using high-end notebooks like a MacBook Pro, maybe it's time you considered an upgrade. There is no other device that weighs this little, takes up this small amount of space, and offers this kind of power. A gaming laptop with a modern discrete GPU can beat it, of course, but those things cost an absolute fortune and they weigh nearly as much as my desktop. So for around $900 to $1100 fully specced up, I think it's a good deal. But let's put gaming back on the table again. The bottom line is that it plays a lot of slightly older, hugely popular titles very well. And if you want something portable and you can't afford a real gaming laptop and you don't need the screen anyway, then this is for you. But if you're a serious gamer, and by that I mean you want to play the latest AAA titles at high resolution with all the dials cranked up, it can't do it. But for less than the cost of a gaming laptop that can, you can buy the Skull Canyon and the overpriced Razer Core and say a GTX 1070 because you can get that combo for easily less than $2,000 and you can blow any gaming laptop into next week when you're at home, but still have a very powerful machine to take with you to work, as I will, uh, for other purposes. And you can keep upgrading that discrete GPU in the Razer Core, something you can't do with a gaming laptop. Now, if you don't need the portability, then it's not for you. You might as well build a mini ITX machine for less money, or even a tower for greater savings, um, as long as you don't mind living like it's 1999. Me? I'm very happy with this machine, and I'm now impatiently waiting for the Razer Core. When I get it, I'll definitely benchmark it with this NUC again, uh, most likely with the 980 Ti uh, to see what this new unit of computing can really do. What do you guys think? Is it a disappointment? Um, is the Razer Core a must-buy for you if you were to consider this? Or will you stay loyal to your tower PC until someone tears it from your cold dead fingers? Uh, let me know in the comments. If you found this review helpful, let me know by hitting the like button and dropping me a comment. And check out some of my other reviews and how-tos, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos.